now move on to our next speaker, uh, Shelley Wright of UCSD, talking about LIGER, Next Generation AOFED Imager and Spectrograph. Uh, the floor is yours, Shelley. Hi, everybody. I'm Shelley Wright from UC San Diego. Um, I'm going to speak on behalf of the entire LIGER team. Uh, LIGER is a future Keck instrument that we are currently in the preliminary design phase. Its name comes from a hybrid animal from tiger and lion. So what we're doing here is taking the 10 years worth of design for IRIS, which is a first light instrument for the 30 meter telescope and adapting it for the Keck AO system, hence our hybrid here for LIGER. We have a large uh, technical team. Um, it's myself, um, James Larkin as a co-PI and Tucker Jones uh, serves as our project scientist. Um, our science team has been expanded with Tucker um, at the helm. If you're interested in today's uh, talk and getting involved with LIGER, please feel free to um, email Tucker with your favorite science case. We would love to have more um, to include here. So what is LIGER? So uh, it is a next generation adaptive optics instrument. It's a facility class instrument that will have broad ranges of science. It's geared for um, going on to Kappa um, on K1. The interesting things about LIGER is that we want to extend below one microns to get to about 840 nanometers. It has a sequentially fed imager, so the imager feeds into a hybrid integral field spectrograph where you can have a slicer or a lenslet field. So the imager has a 10 milli arc seconds per pixel plate scale, which is 20 by 20 arc seconds field of view. The integral field spectrograph uses the workhorse R of 4000, which is typical of the other AO fed IFSs around the planet. But what's unique is that we're trying to get to doubling that spectral resolving power to R of 8,000 and even in some select cases R of 10,000 to get to a range of um, spaxel scales from 15 milli arc seconds out to 150 milli arc seconds. So a coarse scale and a finest scale for the diffraction modes. So this is an overview of that. Um, the CAD there is a recent design of the doer, which is an octagon that sits on the rails of, a, of the old Osiris cart where it would feed in on railroad tracks in and out of the AO enclosure. The green here highlights the imager um, field of view. Um, the imager and the spectrograph share the same filter wheel. So these are sequential, they're parfocal, and they operate simultaneously. The user then can select between a slicer in blue or red, the lenslet. And the beauty of this uh, spectrograph design is that all of the major expensive components like the common grading, we have 14 gradings on a huge turret here, and the common TM, um, common camera TMA, which is quite expensive, and the Hawaii 4 RG detector, which really allows to expand into these capabilities. So some of the science drivers, again, this is a facility class instrument, which will have broad science from you know, the nearest asteroids to the furthest galaxies. But at high um, R at 8,000, this will be two times better than any current IFS. Um, it will be better than James Webb, um, NERSPEC. Um, getting to higher spectral resolving powers is interesting for black hole dynamical mass measurements and very interesting for anything with stellar abundances and atmospheric studies for this. We want to extend to the shorter wavelength coverage um, uh, to get below that direction limit. This is currently not a capability for any ground-based or space-based IFU at this time. This um, has long range implications for stellar and galactic systems solar system bodies, young stars. Um, there's a large range of science cases that really want to tackle and get that calcium triplet line. And then of course, simply just based on efficiency and getting large fields of view, there's a number of um, crowded field spectroscopy cases that you want to get to in star forming regions. The field of view is four times better than any existing ground-based um, IFU and eight times better than James Webb for the NERSPEC. And there's no other system that's par focal with the imager in the IFS. Um, so I'm an instrumentationalist. I like to think about, I love Etendu. So um, this is my IFU version of this, which is Etendu color. So you have something where it includes your aperture, right? The square meters. It includes your field of view of your uh, spaxels, so your square arc seconds versus your wavelength coverage. And of course, of an IFU, you want to compare that to your spectral resolving power. So how does this compare? So if you look at um, Liger's finest scale and coarsest scale, so the finest scale here is highlighted in Osiris, and you see where this would compare at R4000 for Liger and A10 du color. And then if you take the coarsest scale for Osiris, which is at 100 milli arc seconds, which does have performance limitations, but compare it to Liger coarse scale at 4K in the slicer, you can actually get a 20% band pass, so there's a star underneath that. 
other star, which is at the 40% band pass for this. And then the completely unique modes really are these Liger course and fine scales at 8,000. And we're offering a 40% band pass H plus K um, Y plus J format within this. So it's a many science cases. I don't have time to go through all of them, but I just want to highlight a few of them. One of the key science cases that we're working with our science team is trying to understand dark matter and dark energy with quad lens quasars. So what you see is on the left, real data that's taken with the OSIRIS system. Um, you have a galaxy, which you can't see, or the, the G here, right here, and you get three of the four quad, len uh, quad lenses here with an OSIRIS. And on the right, we've used a full end data simulator for LIGER that shows the galaxy at the center and the four quads. If you understand the um, flux ratio anomalies between A, B, C, D, then you can understand the dark matter distribution that's at the galaxy. So if there's substructures and with this um, increased performance in LIGER, you get five times higher signals to noise and you're able to probe down, you know, to get to those dark matter substructure measurements. Similarly, besides flux ratio anomalies, you can take time delays within this and probe um, dark energy within these um, quad lenses. Another case that really um, highlights this need for higher spectral resolving power is intermediate mass black holes. So the beauty of the adaptive optic system with the diffraction limit of um, LIGER and the high astrometry afforded with this is that you're able to get down to this region here where you're trying to get to these tens to 15 kilometers per second within the sphere of the influence of an IMBH at a globular cluster or a dwarf galaxy. And you really have to use AO and an IFU to even push to get to this science case. This is, you know, we love to highlight the galactic center with the AO system. On the left is the actual data right now with OSIRIS. Red is highlighted in SAGE star. Blue is SO6, which is a star that um, Andrea Gez and Tuando like to use to understand the stellar abundances and the high metallicity stars within these systems. But what's interesting about this is that you can use, if you go to R of 8000 and you look at a star like SO6, you can then probe down and get into the splitting of the sodium atom which brings a very interesting science case of trying to understand the strong gravity regime and looking at slight variations of the fine structure constant. And our simulations show that we'd be able to get the precisions comparable to the current quasar probes but down to about 10 to the minus five for this unique case. And then as you can just see with the instantaneous Liger field of view, you cover all of those inner arc second sources which are incredibly useful to arriving radial velocities looking at orbital processions for exploring each other in relativity and getting to, you know, these shorter period stars. The last case I want to highlight um, is in exoplanet formation. While LIGER is not designed to be a discovery machine for direct imaging um, exoplanets, it will be quite interesting for characterizations um, for two reasons. One is just the R of 8000 modes. So you can think about taking your favorite HR 8799 planet, which we've heard a lot about today. Um, and then taking a spectroscopy. But if you, that's typically done at K and L where you're looking at molecular features. But if you take that study and you move it down to, you know, one micron here, like in the simulation on the left, you're then able to actually get direct metallicity probes that aren't impacted by the non-equilibrium chemistries within that atmosphere to probe directly the metallicity of these exoplanets and get to the, gravi the surface gravity. And this has important implications on how these systems form and their theoretical formation models. So where are we now? The imager and spectrograph optical design is complete. Um, our mechanical engineers are busy packaging the imager and the spectrograph in that doer that I showed. Um, the science team has generated top level requirements that's flowed down to all of the instrument subcomponents. We have a data simulator. So if you have, if you have a favorite source you'd like us to simulate, please contact us. Uh, we have a preliminary design review in March of 2021 and we're planning to apply for full funding and an NSF call um, this fall, um, as well as just so with an early uh, spring of 2021. And our first light is projected to be early 2026 um, after the delivery of CAPA. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Um, we're just about out of time, but I wanted to throw out one thing. I was just at a poster by Jean-Baptiste Rufio, who was looking at HR 8799 with Osiris, and it sounds like uh, 
this would do a good job at similar science and you can actually do exoplanet searches because you have the spectral resolution. Um, so it might be worth uh, checking in on that for another science case. Great. Yeah, um, there's one be good for speckle suppression. Yeah. There's one other question. Um, in the Aten Etendu color uh, versus resolving power phase space, how does MUSE compare? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I actually have that in a table and I can compare it. Uh, of course, MUSE has a very large field of view, so it compares very nicely to it. The one thing component, I, I could add that to it, but the one caveat here when I was looking at this um, is a strel performance. And so while MUSE has a GLAO performance, I actually was trying to dig up those numbers, but I'm happy to answer that question and discuss it further with whoever's asking that. Great, and we'll continue that in Slack and we have to move on. Thank you very much, Shelley.